Hello. Today in community development, we're going to speak about specific models and strategies. So in community development, hopefully we learned about in the process that how we get there is more important than where we end up. The process or journey is what is important. A community worker will not really know where a community development process will lead. So they might not be certain of the, of the outcomes. There obviously needs to be a clear vision of what one hopes to achieve, um, but often what is most important part is the process, that the community itself is in full participation and has been empowered in that process. We've previously discussed the foundations of community development in uh, ecological and social justice. And uh, you have uh, talked about, you know, various, uh, you've read about, pardon me, various models um, and strategies of community development, um, such as, uh, you know, social development, political and economic development. And obviously, there's also then, you know, personal, spiritual, social, health, and cultural development is important to communities. So in um, your reading on Rothman, you learned about social, political, and economic uh, development a bit and what these are. So... We have focused quite a bit on social development, you know, focusing on um, sense of community, um, and then that's really about, you know, personal health and, and access to certain things. So I'm going to not focus so much on talking about social development, but kind of talk more about how political and economic development is related. So with political development, altering the distribution of power within a community is important so that it can be more equitably shared. And, you know, that's really the goal. The other goal is to empower the community to operate more effectively within the wider society. So if you increase the power of individuals and groups within the community, they can contribute then to community processes, um, activities, and decisions. So often kind of models and strategies of political development are, you know, consciousness raising, organize, organizing, and social action. In terms of economic development, it's often focused then on, you know, economic crises, poverty, um, economically disadvantaged. From a community development perspective, the response to the economic crisis then is more to develop an alternative approach which seeks to relocate economic activity within the community, to work towards the community's benefit, to revitalize the community, and to improve quality of life. So approaches with economic development are often involve attracting industry, um, like persuading a firm or, you know, a factory to locate a new plant in the community, um, you know, uh, encouraging local industry, using local resources, um, use initiative and expertise to develop new locally based industry. You know, for example, that's what they've done with uh, the oil industry in Newfoundland, although I'm not so sure that's been that positive for community development. Um, economic development also could be tourism, cooperatives, uh, community banks and credit uni unions, um, and, you know, lots of other kind of, uh, for example, there's even alternative community-based currencies. Um, people have like local, uh, we're developing even different currency systems besides money, for example, um, or think of the barter system is a form of a community-based currency. I personally am very fond of the barter system. So you did read in Rothman about social planning, social action, and locality development. 
Now that we've spoken more about the foundations of community development and the um, process of community development, I feel we, I want to come back and speak to then what actually are these different models of community development and then specifically about strategies. And I've presented it here that I have the strategies under these different models, but um, you obviously you could, these are very interchangeable and obviously they're very related to each other. So first is social planning. Well, social planning is the process of people of a community defining their needs and working out what is what has to happen in order to have those needs met, as well as how the existing services and resources can be coordinated and utilized to the best effect, you know, to meet those needs. So the goal is then addressing specific social issues and problems. Social planning um, deals with concrete deficiencies, often defects or illnesses, and often the official name of the organization signifies, you know, these uh, issues, you know, mental health department, municipal housing authorities, the Canadian Cancer Society, again, all with a specific societal, you know, issue or group or segment of the population. So the focus is on these social problems and social needs. It's really about the solving of social problems and the satisfying of social needs. So change then will occur in social planning through the coordination of services. Could be, um, and that means, you know, like organizing services uh, under one umbrella or making it easier for someone to do so. Uh, for example, I think of the Seniors Resource Center of uh, Newfoundland, um, or Seniors NL, that is, you know, it's focusing on um, providing an organization that's kind of one-stop shop for seniors in Newfoundland, where they can then access all the other resources that are available either locally or in the province. There's also the initiation and development of new services and facilities, you know, that might maybe need to be addressed in order to meet needs. The strategies of social planning are a lot about, you know, let's get the facts and think through the, the logical next steps. So it's really about gathering pertinent data about the problem and then deciding on an empirically supported and feasible course of action. So that's kind of fact finding, you know, research skills. It's about designing um, maybe formal plans and policy fra frameworks. Um, there's often, it could be conflict or consensus tactics might be used, uh, but usually more often it's cooperative participation. So under the social planning model, who makes decisions? Well, it can be the practitioner and or local people. So always the practitioner, though. It often is practitioner focused. It may not even be done with the participation of others or the local people. So the local people, could, though, can have a genuine role in the making of priority decisions. But often community participation might not be a core ingredient. And I would say this is particularly true of um, you know, government organizations, and that might not be that they don't care about um, people and, you know, they're them making decisions or their input, but I think it might be just a, um, a lack of ability, maybe, or understanding of how to gather that information in the first place. And people often think it's expensive when it, it doesn't have to be. So what's your role as a practitioner under social planning? Well, you're really a technical person and an expert. So it's the emphasis um, of technical skills in the process of problem solving in order to address social, you know, social issues. And so it could be like community diagnosis, you have to have research skills, understanding information about other communities, you know, getting advice um, on procedures and methods from other organizations. Um, other like programming skills, evaluation, etc. 
So organizations that would fit in with social planning, um, examples is really any city department or not-for-profit that is focused on, you know, mental health, health, recreation, aging, housing, child wel welfare, disability, I should have put disability there, but it's kind of broader under health. So any of these kind of um, issues. The next is social action. Um, and so we'll discuss what social action is. Social action then, uh, of course, this is very embedded in the, you know, uh, the foundation of social justice uh, and equity. So social action is really about the shifting of power and resources. Um, and the focus is really on, you know, disadvantaged segments of the population that might need to be organized or aided in order to make sure their demands on a larger community for increased resources and equal treatment. And this can be a cover a wide range of issues and strategies for that change. And this could be, you know, this could be a, a group of people, of lay people, of informal, um, or it could be through, you know, a formal organization where, you know, there is a practitioner. But really the goal then is some form of change. Um, and this could be, you know, for example, better public transportation or the preserving natural environment or stopping a high rise development. You know, um, these are all social action issues. So the focus then is uh, really on policies, power and decision making. So it's uh, helping people acquire and exercise power. And uh, so the objectives then is really um, over locally based power and decision making. So in order to help with, you know, whatever the need or problem is going on. So uh, again, it's about trying to figure out where to target uh, change. And it's often at this structural level. So how does change occur? Well, it's through the changing of social practices and policies. It's emphasized uh, changing specific uh, policies of government and formal organizations. Interventions seek to change legislative mandates of political entities like city council or policies and practices of institutions. So the strategies under social action are really like, let's organize to overpower our oppressor and change the system. So it's really about targeting this oppressor or, you know, whoever you think is like the, I loosely use the word enemy here, but you're pressuring them for change. So it's confrontation and direct action and often in, involves uh, the ability to mobilize large numbers of people in order to carry out rallies, marches, boycotts, and uh, picketing. So, you know, you're really thinking um, like the social rights uh, movements, you know, of the 60s here. So who makes the decisions? Well, it's the practitioner and the local people. And hopefully, you know, really the aim here is it shouldn't just be the practitioner. It's not really social action. It's to empower and benefit poor or disenfranchised or oppressed uh, and helping them to be empowered to make the change necessary for themselves. And so the role then of the practitioner is really to be an activist, to advocate and be a negotiator. So, you know, you're organizing people, um, you're acting on behalf of their interests, you're seeking to create um, and guide mass organizations and movements. So it's really a lot of, you know, civil rights groups are examples here. Or, you know, Black Lives Matters, for example, movement, think uh, broadly. Lastly is locality uh, development, um, and this is uh, the last model that uh, not all community development readings talk about this, but this is very much something that's very much embedded in recreation as well. So the goal of locality development is to help people to help themselves. Simple as that. 
Um, and so the focus then is the process of educating people and nurturing personal development. Of central, import, of central importance is the community's growing capacity to become integrated and to engage in cooperative problem solving. So it's about delivering services to meet people's needs and enhance people's autonomy, self-respect, and their ability to work together to solve common problems. So notice this isn't just about service provision, but it's about providing the services and resources while you are increasing self-determination and empowerment among people so that they can enhance their own capacity and, the, and enhance the capacity of the community. So change occurs really through broad participation by a variety of people at the local level. Um, you know, practitioners, teachers, uh, community leaders, chill, uh, all the ages of, you know, just residents of the community, everyone. So the strategies then are really like, let's all get together and talk this over. It's a concentrated effort to bring a wide range of people into determining what their felt needs are and to help them to solving their own problems. So it's about local initiative and shared decision making. So in terms of community develop of sorry of locality development, um, the decisions then are made really in the direction and control are really hopefully in the hands of the local people. So while a practitioner might be working in this capacity, you are a facilitator, not an expert. So it's really determining goals and taking civic action. The practitioner then is an enabler and an encourager is their role. Putting people in touch with one another and promoting their membership in groups and networks. It's about developing people's sense of power and significance um, in, in their association with others. It could be guiding small task oriented groups. It also requires skill in fostering collaboration uh, collaborative problem finding and problem solving. Notice we always talk about problem solving, but sometimes the the hardest part is to figuring out what the problems are, finding the what the problem. We often can find out what is what the issues are, but what are really the root causes of things? And so through social, political, and economic development. Under the models of social planning, social action, and locality development, we then have community building. All community development should aim at community uh, building. And I hope you can understand how much then, to me, it's just common sense then how embedded recreation and leisure are in developing community because community involves building social capital. The attitude, spirit, and willingness of people to engage in collective civic activities. It is the strengthening the social interactions within a community, bringing people together, helping people to communicate with each other in a way that can lead to genuine dialogue, understanding, and social action. And it's really about seeking to reverse isolation, and individualism. And again, all of these things are very much connected to the outcomes of recreation and leisure, whether it is uh, community recreation or therapeutic recreation. So we'll now move into looking at specific strategies that are used in order to uh, you know, create these outcomes. And I'm going to kind of frame these strategies within specific uh, community development models. But again, they're all very interrelated and can be used no matter what. So strategies. The first strategy is service development. And that obviously I've put that logically under social planning because, you know, one of the goals of social planning is often service development. 
So service development, you know, it involves the identification of social needs and the provision of structures and services to meet them. So, um, and then the focus then is on the, obviously the identification of these needs and providing these services. And this often involves um, a six stage process in terms of service development. So first it's the, the identification of a concern or issue um, among service providers or in the community at large. For example, maybe there's a lack of recreation facilities for youth or loneliness among older adults or increased vandalism. The second step then is to collect information, a detailed study of the need or the problem. You know, what's the nature and extent of the problem? And this again can be discussions with service providers. You could do a needs assessment or survey. What has also happened in other communities, you know, looking at statistics, et cetera. And then hopefully, and not without just lip service, you involve the community. So like a public meeting, a forum, or some form of consultation. So including all interested people are encouraged to attend and participate. And then that way the group can determine some course of action. Um, what's the next step? You know, is it a youth center or a senior center? You know, what is the step? Fourth is the, um, you know, you have to do all the necessary formalities of often a new organization or a new program or service. And then it's really kind of, uh, you know, implementing that and uh, ongoing operation of that new organization or service. And, you know, hopefully evaluating to see if that often meets the needs. Now, I don't, I have to admit that I don't know if uh, all these steps always take place. And I would say sometimes um, consultation of, of among people is not always done properly. And certainly, unfortunately, a lot of the time we don't evaluate very well. We kind of, you know, we develop the service or program and then kind of just walk away. Social planning can also involve uh, tourism. And we can say, you know, in um, Newfoundland, you know, this is certainly used for economic, political, and social development. So, but usually the goal is economic development. And um, so the aims then, or the focus of this strategy are obviously to attract more tourists into the community and to encourage tourists to stay as long as possible in the locality obviously in order, you know, maybe to spend uh, more money. Um, now, this is maybe a bit of a cynical view because I would also say that there's more cultural development. For example, in Newfoundland, tourism certainly um, provides pride to Newfoundlanders and also it provides education about Newfoundland culture to others um, and especially to, you know, in reducing um, stereotypes often as well. Um, so I think that, you know, it's not just about money. Hopefully there's also a cultural exchange. And tourism can really help with economic development. You know, it's a potential source of income. Um, often it's a clean industry that doesn't pollute. Well, it can be, although obviously a lot of fossil fuels are in, um, you know, air um, in flying. Um, and cars, the transportation part. But especially, for example, in Newfoundland, a lot of the tourism is, you know, once people get around, if we took out the transportation part, you know, it, it's often green and, you know, a lot of outdoor recreation. It can usually support a variety of occupations, you know. A tourism needs accountants. It needs um, outdoor recreation educators. It needs... Um, you know, recreation programmers, it needs dancers, it needs uh, singers, uh, it needs special events facilitators, um, business people, restaurants, you know, I could go on, tons of incomes. And so it can bring benefits to a variety of businesses, creating many types of jobs. It can really put a community on the map. 
but there are problems with tourism. Um, you can easily develop a problem of insufficient demand, like then you have hard economic times or there's a fad, or, you know, like in Newfoundland, um, you know, it's very, it's so seasonal. You've got, you know, uh, two or three months and then there's nothing for the rest of the year. And it can have negative effects on the community itself. It could exploit the local culture, heritage, or environment, crowding. Um, and sometimes the local community needs to take second place to tourism. And if some of you live in a neighborhood that uh, has a lot of tourists come or a you know town, uh, you'll understand, you know, you're just trying to get to your regular life and yet you're um, having to negotiate all the tourists. Then we have educating. So obviously education is simply educating individuals about a social, political, or environmental issue. And there are a variety of ways to educate. But the most powerful and influential uh, community education tool is the mass media. Newspapers, radios, television, internet, and obviously social media. Um, but major problems that this has uh, to organizations is that often the news is events oriented. It's interested in a special event that have a crisp beginning and ending. So sometimes it can be hard to, you know, for change because it's just like a one hit wonder. Um, but not all the time, you know, you can develop um, these issues. And in Newfoundland, because it's a small place, it's very e easy and to use the media, you know, um, to educate the community about specific issues. Other ways to educate the community are like writing letters or emails. Um, you know, um, the people, their research says, you know, politicians, for example, for every letter they receive, they assume that a hundred people or more, a thousand, depending on how, how uh, dense their population is, has that same opinion. Writing letters is very effective. Um, I do it all the time. And, you know, it, it's often just, um, it's just like raising an issue that maybe someone didn't even know about or posing a question. Sometimes asking a question um, is uh, educating because, um, you know, it makes the person kind of think of the answer and maybe then it helps them to see a gap. You can also have public meetings, fact-finding forums, obviously posters, pamphlets, booklets, slideshows and videos. And obviously, I would say today, mostly it's going to be massive, you know, social media campaigning, too. Next, we have negotiating and lobbying. And this is obviously very much a part of social action. So the goal of negotiating and lobbying is to have an impact on the key decision makers in order to create change. So negotiation is really then um, it's strategic discussions that you would have with key decision makers in order to have an impact on policy. So for example, um, you know, I have in my career at Munt had many uh, talks with government when it comes to recreation or seniors or people with disabilities. And it's simply just to, you know, have a discussion. And sometimes it's just to share information or maybe they're not aware of certain issues that are going on in the community. And, you know, this can be lobbying. Lobbying is making key decision makers aware of a position and trying to get their support. And often organizations have a lobbying uh, mandate. For example, Recreation Newfoundland and Labrador, one of their purposes is to lobby government on important recreation issues that impact the province. So you'll find that you have to negotiate and lobby more than you think in your life, in your career. Um, 
whether it is, you know, whether you're working, let's say, in a um, healthcare system, hospital setting, you know, or whether it is, um, you know, in community recreation. So you have to really be strong and offer a benefit. You have to negotiate with strength. Um, and you need to know your group's kind of bottom line and how to present it. You always have to be understanding of the public eye. Um, make sure that uh, what you say in the image, you know, especially when you're dealing with politicians, etc. You know, always be respectful, etc. You know, and think of how you're phrasing things. It's important not to compromise your position, not to back down, and you can do that with respect. Learn how to make deals with decision makers without compromising your position. Um, it's often easier to target a person rather than the system because it, um, and I don't mean that to, in a bullying way, like a target them, but it's just like, you know, if you have one key person that you're communicating with, that's easier than just writing a general, you know, dear government letter, for example. And you need to use how to use both conflict as well as collaboration. And it's important to look at your group's resources, interests, and the people in the system and decide on the issues and develop strategies for how to negotiate and lobby. And it's also important to have success because when you're, this is very important for the morale of the group. Um, and, you know, having tiny successes, you know, for example, maybe you're not going to change the whole transportation system of St. John's, but maybe you were able to have a small success of making sure that there was proper um, curbing and ramps, you know, at one intersection. Well, you know, that's a success. Whistleblowing. Um, wh whistleblowing, I don't know if you've heard of this, but you know, that's when you basically are um, calling people out on something. You know, you're bringing attention to any illegal, immoral, or wrongful practices in a setting where one works or lives with the intent of stopping or changing it. Um, and, you know, there's lots of examples, you know, you can have of whistleblowing and often what can what is unfortunate is this can involve the experiencing of ostracization in or job loss uh, there's often a lot of great risk to the whistleblower uh, and you know i myself have done whistleblowing um and in a few instances in my life um and you know it took uh bravery and I always knew, though, that I was not going to lose my job, um, I have to say, because, you know, I, I did it with respect. Um, and but, um, you know, it can be hard, but I think it's basically about I, I don't think whistleblowing doesn't have to be it has, often has a negative connotation. But I mean, and sometimes it is a very serious thing that you are raising um, as an example. But. It might also just be about bringing the attention of an issue to someone at the right time. You know, and I just kind of a small example. Um, I remember being at a um, conference in St. John's on disability, and I over, I had, was talking to some students, and they were talking about um, how at Academy Canada or with trades that um, when people were having uh, accommodated exams that they didn't get their exam results until later and it meant that they were behind applying for jobs compared to the rest of the class and there and you know when you have a disability it's already a struggle um, to you know get through the education and then even find a job well um, I didn't need to like make a big stink about that but all I did was then when I was speaking to someone at Inclusion NL who focuses on education and also workplace issues um you know I mentioned this to them and then sh they were able then to probably go and deal speak with the education organization all I did was take a phone call not a big deal 
and I think it made a big difference, hopefully, um, in the ability for people to get jobs in the province. So it doesn't always have to be a serious nature. It can sometimes just be, you know, attuning people to things that aren't right. But then you can also have protesting. Um, and, uh, you know, often uh, protesting ha also has a variety of formats, too. It usually, um, it, protesting is consciousness raising, another sort of form of consciousness raising. Uh, it usually involves staging of public demonstrations or forums, orchestrating boycotts, could be a boycotts of commercial goods or services, or withholding labor, developing clear-cut demands, or carrying out symbolic acts. Um, and often due to the fact that protesting typically attracts media attention and public reaction, though, it is important for group to be careful in considering the use of protest as a means of addressing a specific action. Um, but for example, you know, um, uh, one of the protests I've been to has been, you know, at Confederation Hall among the uh, Coalition for People with Disabilities, um, looking at, you know, rights, disability rights in the province. And I was uh, with, with a friend who's able-bodied and his wife who is in a wheelchair. Um, and it was quite interesting um, during the protest um, and uh, the... Uh, government people coming out and speaking to the group. Um, this man's, uh, you know, my friend needed, who's in the wheelchair needed to use the bathroom, but was unable to get into Confederation Hall where they were standing because there was no ramp. Um, so it's not an accessible entrance. So in front of the whole media and everything, um, he picked up his wife and carried her in in order for her to use the facilities um so i actually that act that um part of the media was probably a stronger part of the protest than anything because not we were protesting something and there was a real life example of the inequities in the province when it comes to accessibility when it comes to locality development there's, you know, you can use a variety of strategies and service development is, cer is certainly part of locality development, although I'd put it with social planning, but cooperatives are often used. And there's a strong history, as we've learned in this class, especially like in Cape Breton, um, in Nova Scotia, in the uh, 20s and 30s, as a result of the Depression, also in the prairies, um, as well, any agricultural communities. So the goal of cooperatives is for people organizing and for mutual economic benefit. And cooperatives were essentially ways of people organizing um, for mutual economic benefit through the pooling of production and resources. And they're really a viable alternative to conventional economic structures. And really, they're challenging the competitive ethic of our society. So the focus of cooperatives, it takes really on very many different forms, depending on local needs and local cultures. And there's many different um, types. They could have social, economic, or political, or cultural contexts. Um, you know, there's worker cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, housing cooperatives, intentional communities. So these range in size. They can be very small and informal. You know, I'm thinking, uh, just an example, um, on the street in Newfoundland, where we lived, there was uh, eight houses, and we all organized to share snow clearing. Um, certain families had the snowblowers. Others' families purchased other types of snow equipment. Everyone had their job, which has to do when, and we all shared the resources as well as the work. And also, this was to also make sure that the we made sure that the older adults uh, on our street were had their needs met. And, um, or it could be a very formal, large group. And, you know, I'm thinking of the large consumer cooperative of, you know, Mountain Equipment Co-op. Um, and there's really the basis of cooperative cooperations or cooperatives is that it's voluntary and open membership, democratic control, 
limited return on capital surplus and earnings. There, it's returned back to the members. There's usually education and um, often cooper cooperation between cooperatives. Um, another example I want to share was I went to a nursery school, a daycare that was a cooperative. So it was um, you, um, you know, obviously my parents paid some so much money for me to attend the daycare. Um, but it and there was um, maybe two or three full time staff, but that wasn't sufficient. So on top of that, parents went and had shifts. So my mom had to go and um, be a staff person so many times. Sometimes she had to help in the kitchen or maybe help with an activity or on the weekend it could be um, cleaning of the facility and that kind of thing. So everyone pitched in in order to reduce costs and create kind of a community. And there are recreation co-ops and they provide recreation services uh, to members. And you know they've really been established in Canada even before the 1920s. These services can be very diverse. They range from community halls, curling rinks, recreation centers, television services, golf courses, and community theaters. The operation of sailing clubs whose members share the use of sailboats, for example. And these all foster a sense of community. I think in, I think I've mentioned to you before, for example, when I lived in Georgia, um, there was part of the Grad Student Association was GORP. It was um, the Georgia Outdoor Recreation Program or something, but it was a co-op. You know, you paid, I don't know, so much money a year and we're talking like 10 bucks. Then you got to rent equipment um, for very affordably in order to have uh, rec recreation experiences. In St. John's, there's tool co-ops where, um, you know, there people are sharing tools, you know, for home renovations or yard tools. Not everyone needs, for example, to have a chainsaw. Um, or there's also book co-ops now. There's, um, uh, you know, I've uh, lending library things. Um, anyway, all these different types of uh, co-ops where people you know, pay a little bit in order to have membership. Oh, another example is food sharing. You know, I've, um, like, uh, I, my husband and I, we helped to run a, uh, well, he was the main person, Seed to Spoon, which is a food co-op. So you put money in a hedge to help the farmer, and then all of the, um, in a way, you're kind of co-owner of the crop for that year, and then you the shares of the crops go out to everyone. Also with locality development is often consciousness raising. And you could see, I mean, I've spoken about, um, obviously, um, protesting is consciousness raising. Education is consciousness raising. These are all specific, but I just want to speak about consciousness raising um, on its own. So, there is a need to raise levels of consciousness to allow people the opportunity to explore their own situations and the oppressive structures and discourses that frame their lives in such a way that they can act to bring about change. So the goal of consciousness raising is public awareness of injustices, inequities, and social issues. It's people involved in community organizing working together to bring injustice and inequality to the forefront of public awareness and demand action. So the focus then is on um, really diff many different levels of change at the neighborhood level, municipal level, provincial or national, or even global. You know, I would, um, the Black Lives Matters is, you know, bringing um, these issues to our consciousness at the global level. So education really is an essential ingredient of community organizing and change. And there's many different forms of consciousness raising. And another form of locality development is community centers, I wanted to mention. Because community centers 
are at the heart um, of a lot of communities, and they're also a, a large part of recreation and leisure. Um, for example, many people end up working at community centers. So the goal really is to build, you know, obviously social capital. In history, we've talked about this, churches were really the first community centers, the places where people could meet, discuss important matters and be social. You know, it was, you know, outside of church, it was used as a, as a civic gathering space. So the focus of community centers is, you know, to build social capital. It is the attitude, spirit, and willingness of people to engage in collective activities. Um, it's when people collaborate and cooperate. So community centers then can provide a central meeting place um, with some degree of resourcing, whether that's staff, volunteers, funds, or equipment. And it can be used for a variety of activities, education, politics, cultural, health, advocacy, recreation. The um, initiative for developing a community center can even come from a number of organizations. It could be a local government, provincial, not-for-profit, church, community groups, or even the members themselves. So that was um, some of the various models of community development and strategies. And I hope you're able now to see how all of this is kind of tied together. You know, we now have a kind of understanding of what communities are, what community development is, what the foundations of community development are, its process, and now the models and strategies people use in order to create change and create community and community building.